Welcome to Crawl Space. I'm Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I am doing great today, Tim. One of the reasons why I'm doing so great is because we made it through this interview in one piece. I was nervous before we started due to the subject matter. I don't know if you felt the same way, but I am glad to be here today. I'm glad to be here in the saddle with you. How are you, sir? I am doing great now, but I was terrified during this interview with uh, Grammy Award winner Larry Mullins. He is an impressive guy, Lance. I think he said he he won six Grammys, a six time. Is that what he said? I do believe he said a six time Grammy winner. He was in the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. He also won an ER Murrow Award for Best Newscast. And he's joining us because he is the host of of the show your weirdest fears it is a great show i've been listening to it it's funny it's informative and we were introduced to larry by our friend famey redwood who we had on the air a couple of months ago to speak about her great show beyond black history month and we really had a great conversation i feel like we had a great rapport with him he was hilarious He was really one of the funniest guests that I think we've ever had on the air. Right. He had a way of speaking and a way of just laughing, which would cause you to laugh as well. And we would move on to the next subject. And when we bring up our weirdest fears to him, his reactions are priceless. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, how could we let this interview pass without filling him in on what we think our weirdest fears are? The conversation really runs at a pace that is entertaining. Like you said, super funny. And you can follow Larry on Twitter at LC Mullins, that's M-U-L-L-I-N-S, wins. He also broadcasts for the news organization 1010 Wins out of New York City. And definitely be sure to listen to Larry's show, Your Weirdest Fears. Larry's voice alone should motivate you to listen to this. And Tim, if folks wanted to listen to this interview with Larry and other episodes of our show without any ads, where in the world would they go? Well, they can subscribe to Crawl Space Premium right there in their Apple Podcasts app. It's $4.99 a month. You get early releases, you get ad-free episodes, and weekly bonus episode, Lance. And non-Apple users can go to crawlspace.supportingcast.fm and subscribe to the same product of Crawl Space Premium right there. And Tim, one of my weirdest fears is that people will never be able to find us on social media. Well, that would be a real shame, but they can do it by searching for Crawl Space Podcast podcast or crawl space pod speaking of the ads we're going to break real quick but stay tuned because larry's coming up right after thanks to our sponsors and now we're back to the program larry mullins welcome to the podcast how are you today i am doing great thank you how are you we are doing fantastic this is a delight to speak with you even though we are approaching it with a little bit of trepidation because of the subject matter that you talk (laughs) about on your show there are ads for your show that's out there and a handful of times we have guests on that have a show that is so clearly obviously cool a brilliant idea so well executed something that when you hear you're like that's so obvious like that is an obvious concept for a show so well done on this oh my gosh all this beautifulness already oh i'm so touched (laughs) well I, i think that's how some of the best ideas seem right they seem like oh how has that not existed yet i know right (laughs) that's what i thought when they first approached me (laughs) yeah i thought oh people's weirdest fears and i thought they were looking into my closet because i'm the scariest person in the studio right when i do the news on wednesday afternoon you know, I have this writer who sneaks in and flips off the light switch, you know, and I'm in the dark and I don't like being in a dark room by myself. That's why I go to sleep quickly. <laughs> and so to keep me from falling asleep before the show, you know, we flip the lights back on. But I am a very scary person. So when they said your weirdest fears, I thought, hmm, somebody's been sneaking around in my background. Nyctophobia, right? Fear yes. of the dark, nyctophobia? Yes. Ha, got it. Yeah. yeah. Well, l- let's speak about that background of yours. How have you gotten to this place in your career? Ah, let's see. I was born in 19... I'm 28 years old. Shut up, Lance. Don't worry about it. I'm old enough to be in the age I want. So I started out in Orlando, Florida, and I was this 16-year-old kid who used to hang out at the back window of a radio station, you know, with a bunch of my friends in the hot sun. One day, all of the other friends didn't show up, so they felt sorry for me and invited me inside, and the rest is history. Got into radio, studied it in high school and college, a few years after college, I um, convinced somebody to hire this kid with an afro this big to do television on CBS down in Orlando. Did that for a few years. 
from there, moved to uh, to Dallas for a job with NBC. I was the head of the news division for uh, the NBC station in Dallas, the Dallas Bureau. And then I became a national correspondent for NBC NBC Nightly News with Tom Brokaw. Did that for a minute. And then um, started my own company to produce different television shows all over the country. Left that because it became too doggone expensive. And then uh, retired. Came here to New York, ran into the folks at 1010 Win CBS at the time, who says, hey, if you're not doing anything but sitting around being lazy, why don't you come in and help us out? And they took me to lunch, and I've been on lunch break ever since. And now I'm the <laughs> afternoon news anchor, primetime anchor on 1010 Wins, where you give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and there you go, in 60 seconds. Incredible. How many times have you been told that your voice is amazing or cool or some incredible compliment about your voice? Since I was born. <laughs> is there any way to have an estimate on that? Uh, 28 years. <laughs> Are you not listening to him? <laughs> Once a day times 28. I don't know where this voice came from. Uh, my voice has been this way since I was about 15 or 16 years old. I have no idea where it came from. My dad's voice wasn't very low. Uh, my mom's voice was not very low. I, I have a brother whose voice is maybe uh, an octave, you know, just below mine. But other than that, this voice has always been, I've been blessed with this voice and uh, it's it's worked out well. It's bought a few houses and put a couple of kids through college. We compliment our guests. <laughs> we put you in a comfortable place before we come out swinging. Yeah, we'll knock you back on your heels in, uh, in no time. <laughs> all right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so tell us about your show, Your Weirdest Fears. How did this show come to you? So Femi Redwood, who is the uh, manager of podcasts at Odyssey and 1010 Wins, came to me one day and says, Blair, got this show. You know, No, she didn't give me the name at first. But she says, this show has got your name all over it. The wit that you show in the afternoons when you're doing the news on 1010 Wins, we know that there's just a, this monster trying to get out. She says, hang on to the keyword monster. She says, we'd like you to test it out and you know, we'll send you a mock-up on it and let you see what it's about. And if you like it, let's go for it. Even if you don't like it, let's go for it anyway. You know, and we'll see what happens. So uh, I got the uh, production sheet on it and it says, uh, the first one was a lady whose weirdest fears dealt with sitting on the toilet and being afraid that a mouse or a snake or a cricket or whatever would crawl up the plumbing and, you know, and, and you know, whatever. And I thought, hmm, <laughs> this is interesting because, hold on, nobody's here but us, right? Correct. I had that same kind of fear. <laughs> That's when I began to think, well, wait a minute, where did y'all get this from? She says, no, you know, and they would go out and actually interview these people with all of these weird fears and they would either call in or they send videos in or they send a letter in talking about their weirdest fears. And uh, we would integrate those into the show. And then the producers would go out and find an expert to help you deal with those phobias. You know, uh, a fear of combustible human body, just you just burst into flames, you know, or, or a guy who's, uh, you know, turns himself into a lizard, part of the, you know, the phobia of somebody who says that they are human animal hybrids out there. So all of these weird things were coming in, you know, and I'm thinking, OK, are you all like making these people up? Is this a joke? Is there a camera somewhere? You know, is somebody going to jump out of the bushes and say, gotcha. So, no, we just think that you're the perfect host for such a show. <laughs> I'm like, why me? I'm an upstanding, meek, quiet newsman. Why would you decide that I'm the guy, the right, the right host for that? <laughs> so here I am. If people haven't listened to this show yet, you have no excuse because it's super interesting and the episodes are like 10 minutes. Yeah, yeah. Their titles should motivate you enough to listen. Chopping your fingers off while cutting veggies. Can this really happen? <laughs> yeah. It's a title like that that makes you think, well, everyone is kind of afraid of cutting themselves while chopping something, but chopping your finger clean off is like, oh, yeah. okay, is that possible? So you listen to that episode and you realize you're not alone. They take it to the extreme, brother. And that was what my question was leading into this. You said at the beginning of this that you are sort of a person who is afraid of multiple things. Are you afraid that by hearing these fears, the ones that you haven't heard before will then become your fears? Yes. <laughs> so is that like a fear of fears? Yes. <laughs> that doesn't scare you? They put you up to saying this. They, you set me up. You bummed. No. The first time I heard the ad for your show, that was my first thought, was this guy is putting himself in some peril. 
<laughs> I think the only one that really freaked me out, there's this cat, and everybody's heard of him, Geo, of uh, Boomer and Geo, you know, on WFAN. Geo's got this fear of volcanoes. And for some reason, he has made it up in his mind that there is a volcano, you know, the the tech, the tech tactic or whatever, the plate is going to shift and Manhattan's going to, you know, is going to blow up an earthquake or whatever the case may be. There's a volcano just waiting to happen. Well, all of a sudden, you know, my dreams and ambitions of rappelling down the side, the inside of a volcano have now gone away. I'm afraid to do that now. You know, it's, it's those types of things. They, they, they make you think some of these uh, weirdest fears that come in on the show. They make you begin to think that, oh, maybe there is something to this. You know, I am concerned now. I was listening to your uh, Afraid of Tall Buildings and Statues episode this morning, and I never had that fear, never even really thought about it. And now I'm like, well, that's actually a pretty logical fear. Like, I know that probably doesn't happen often, that a building or a statue just tips over, but it could. Yeah, I've often wondered about that. I wondered about it even more so after that particular show, because I'm thinking, as tall as these buildings are here in the city, there has to be a foundation that's as deep as the building to hold it up, to keep it from falling over. And I live in a high rise. I remember when I first moved in, in my apartment, I'm in a penthouse apartment, it swayed. You could look in the toilets and see the, the water in the thing. And I'm like, it took me it took me a month to get used to this kind of living. You know, uh, because I thought I'm going to wake up in the morning and I'll be on the ground floor, you know, in the in the river or whatever. Um, but, yeah, I, I have those thoughts about, you know, about these tall buildings. How are they able to stand? And they're building them so skinny now. You know, there's one. I forget the tower. I can see it out the window of the house here in Manhattan. That's so skinny. You think, boy, you know, one little breeze, that thing is going to going to going to snap into or whatever. But I guess engineering. You know, have it set up, has it set up to where uh, that can't happen. So hopefully we'll never find out. That's what I was going to say. These buildings are designed to have that sway to them so that there's like a give and take with the with the wind. So they engineer them to sway, which kind of makes me even more nervous about it because that's like a human being doing some calculation that if he sneezes or if she sneezes and the pen <laughs> slips. So the human error element on that kind of makes me more nervous. So Lance, let me show you. I, I walked around the house just like this. When this first went down, I walked through the house like this, you know, when I first <laughs> moved up here. Oh, it's crazy. Oh, it was crazy. Really? Because I didn't yeah. know. Yeah. Um, and I would sit a ball on the floor just to marvel, just to prove, you know, my concerns. And the thing would roll down one way and it'll roll back the next. And I'm no thinking, kidding. oh, heck no, this ain't going to happen. But you get used to it. I'd pack everything up. <laughs> yeah, you get used to it. I almost did. I almost did until I realized, well, wait a minute, I just bought this place. I can't go anywhere. I'm stuck. You know, so here I am. <laughs> wow. So if you see me on the street and I'm kind of loopy and talking to you like this, you know, it's not because I'm trying to be cool, Modi. It just means that this is the way that I live and that's the way my, my house sways that way. So I've gotten used to it. <laughs> you live on a sway. <laughs> we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsor. And a thank you to our sponsors. Back to the program. The episode about spontaneous combustion was also fascinating. I have heard of, I, I believe, the case that is mentioned. I think it's from Ireland in in the episode where someone, uh, like a medical examiner, ruled that this fellow died by spontaneous human combustion. But in your episode, you and your expert spoke about how he was likely near a flame or he was near a flame, might have been drinking, and that could have been the cause. This is not a fear of mine, but it's something I've thought about for decades since I've heard about it. I really thought that this was possible. I never thought I would combust, but I thought like if you got like, I don't know, like excited enough, eh, it was possible. I always thought if you got liquored up enough with enough alcohol and, and the rum, the Bacardi rum that I used to drink as a kid uh, and went to bed <laughs> with a heater on, that you would catch fire in the middle of the night. That was just my thing. And as it would happen, you know, I started reading as a younger kid, just like you, that, oh, you can actually catch on fire, you know, inexplicably catch fire. And so I thought about that, put it aside for years. And then this guy shows up, you know, in the show, Your Weirdest Fear is talking about it. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I, I was waiting. That is a show where I was actually sitting on pins and needles and waiting on the expert to tell me, is this fact or fiction? <laughs> um, that one had me, that one actually had me a little bit nervous because I thought if they tell me this is actually real and I've had a couple of cocktails too many in the past and 
oh my gosh, I could have caught fire and died in the middle of the night, you know. Um, but as it were, they're saying, no, the, the human is not made up like that. You know, it, it doesn't happen like that. Now, if you're smoking in bed, you know, and you happen to take cyst baths and kerosene or whatever, now we got a problem. Okay. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I kind of, I was able to take a deep breath after that. One. So, so on that note, I have to tell you, this is therapy for me to do these shows, Your Weirdest Fears, because as I told you, you know, I have a lot of weird fears myself. So I'm actually getting free advice from these experts on the slide. So I pretend like, oh, really? Oh, that's too bad when I'm going, oh, Lord, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it's not so spontaneous when you combust after bathing in kerosene. <laughs> Feels to me not not as spontaneous as just spontaneously combusting. So, this is uh, true. yeah, you can feel some uh, relief there. Sorry, Tim, I interrupted. Go. No, no worries. Have you found that when people come on and tell you about their fears, that something in their childhood or past led to this maybe irrational fear? Yes. Uh, in fact, that's a question that I always pose to uh, some of the experts that are on those who are psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, therapists who provide you know, those services to people with fear, I always ask them, is there some underlying, you know, issue that took place in the childhood that would lead for people to be afraid of high buildings or the lady who was afraid of walking down any street in Manhattan or anywhere where there's scaffolding? She will not walk on that side of the street where the scaffolding is. And the general uh, answer is that, yes, there probably has been some stigma, you know, or uh, something that took place in the uh, in the individual's lives you know, that have caused them or have led them to this, you know, to this phobia. One involved a very unusual case where there is a guy who is deathly afraid of balloons. And I'm thinking, okay, as a kiddo, did you have balloons at your party and the people held your face to it and burst it or what? And we never were able to figure out what led to that. But this is a guy who, if he shows up at a grocery store, for example, where they have balloons out front, helium balloons, you know, advertising a particular product or whatever, he will not go inside that store, will not walk inside the store. I'm like, you're missing out on, you know, canned goods, you know, two for one baked beans during the 4th of July because you're afraid of the balloons. So I assume, and I assumed out loud during the taping, uh, you don't go to see the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade where there are these big balloons. <laughs> the answer is absolutely, not only no. <laughs> You know, so I don't know what happened, you know, in the past that caused that. But, you know, I can see that. I feel like I've heard that when I saw that episode or when I listened to that episode. I feel like I had friends who were like, I just can't stand the sound that balloons make when they rub against each other. And that like gets under their skin. It's like a nails on the chalkboard type moment for them. Yeah. So I can understand that. My friend and Tim knows this. My friend has a fear of buttons that are on clothing, the, the shiny plastic shell over the top. And she's like, I can't wear clothes that have buttons like that. And I looked into it because it was fascinating. And I found this out like years ago, like 15 years ago. The more I looked into it, the more it became apparent that as a child, she probably had like a bug crawling on her, like a cockroach or something with like a shiny shell. After that, her brain made the association with shiny buttons that had the same type of like sheen. Have you ever heard about somebody being afraid of buttons? No, I have not. Um, but now that you mention it, you know, uh, I do notice of late that I usually wear something buttonless all the time. Oh no, sorry. <laughs> and I don't know if you just created a phobia or what, but, uh, <laughs> but no, I've not, I've not heard of that. That's very, very unusual. If you come across it, you have our contact info. If you come across it <laughs> and there's an expert who can explain it, I would love to forward that info to her. <laughs> See, that's why I knew I liked you when we signed on to do this thing, because uh, <laughs> I figured you'd turn me on to a therapist there, and I needed it, Lance. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Do you think that social media is helping to add new fears out there to people? I'm asking this specific question because we're talking about the scaffolding. Sometimes I'm on Instagram Reels. They were trying to install a window in this high rise, and the glass plate fell, and then there was a shot of the guy walk just a random guy walking below and the glass nearly kills him right it doesn't but it nearly does and, and i had to watch that video like 10 straight times and oh, I'm, wow. I'm, my mind is blown right my, my point is there are things now that we see on social media that we never would have been exposed to before like 
for example, uh, a video of someone being on a ship that is taking on water and sinking. That is now a fear that I have because I've seen that video. I've never been on a sinking ship, but now I'm terrified to go on a cruise ship or, an, or on any boat. I might never go on a boat again because of that. My, uh, back to the original question. Do you think social media is helping add new fears to people? Yes, indeed. Um, social media has added a lot of stigmas to all of our lives in many, in all facets of our lives. Things that you know we didn't have a clue about in the past, we didn't have any perspective on. Now people are putting it right in our faces, you know, in the way of uh, you know all of the different platforms that are out there. So social media has definitely changed our lives. And with regard to phobias and things of that nature, some of it is you know, is made up. You know, you can imagine people are going out with the um, you know with different streaming uh, opportunities or different streaming techniques or whatever that they can go and manipulate pictures. You know, the likes of all of these different social media. I won't name one in particular because they'll say, "Oh, wait a minute, you said so and so and so." And I don't. I have a phobia of them trying to sue me, <laughs> and um, and only a lawyer can 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 rectify that phobia. Uh, that said, though, but yes, I I see a lot of what we are afraid of. And a lot of the ideology that we subscribe to these days are, are, are somewhat couched in, uh, in the social media that we, that we watch, that we consume. So would you say the reverse is also possible, that by seeing all of this that you wouldn't have seen before, that could maybe train you to be a little more aware of your surroundings and be a little bit more proactive in your own safety? I think so. I mean, conversely, things that we see that might have some altruisms. Uh, it might make sense to go and, oh, well, wait a minute, maybe I shouldn't walk on the side of the sidewalk where they're doing scaffold work, scaffolding or whatever, uh, for fear that it might fall down on my head, no matter, you know, the safety precautions that they put in place. And, you know, you see guys walking around with hard hats on and here you go waltzing along the sidewalk and you've got nothing except, you know, your baseball cap or whatever, you know, so it, it makes you uh, it makes it gives pause. So it's, you know, there's a there's six of one, half a dozen of the other. It just depends, you know, on, on your mindset. I think, though, the people who have the greatest phobias about things that you see appear on this program, your weirdest fears, are the ones who truly have had an experience in their lives that require either some medication or some psychotherapy or some therapist to come in to assist in removing those layers to, to bring that individual back to normalcy. That's not something you can, you know, I can call, I can call my buddy Tim and Lance on the phone and say, hey, what do you think about this? And you guys can, you know, help me and walk me through it. But some others might need, uh, you know, a trained therapist to do it. Not that you're not trained therapist, but. <laughs> I mean, well, we basically true. are. We're, yeah. we're, we're <laughs> podcasters, <laughs> so that's close. <laughs> yeah. Oh, same thing. <laughs> Pretty close, yeah. And we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thanks to our sponsors. And now we're back to the program. What about you? Uh, do you have any weird really weird fears that could end up on this show if you weren't hosting it see now tim if i tell you <laughs> they're gonna have this i'm gonna i'm gonna get a show next yes. week that's probably going to uh be as a result of what i say right now so i'll go ahead and put it out there so i got this fear of getting on not necessarily a subway train in manhattan but i take a path train from my home in New Jersey over into the city, which requires I go under the river. So I don't know if it's a fear versus a phobia or what, but I always get afraid. And it happened yesterday on the train. It came to an abrupt stop and everybody shifted. I'd never felt that uh, on a train, on a path train. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, they sprung a leak under this thing. <laughs> the train's gonna have to back up real, you know, those are my fears that, okay, and I'm, and I'm peeking out the window on the slide thinking, if I see water starting to rise on this thing, I'm getting the hell up out of here. I don't know where I'm getting, but I'm getting the hell up out of here, you know, uh, and that's, and that is one of my weirdest fears that, you know, uh, something's going to go down and, and the, and the tunnel's going to fill up, you know, and the doors aren't as airtight as I would like them, you know, and all of that. So I'm thinking, okay, I don't know, I'm going to get out of this. So that's kind of a phobia of fear that I have. You just used a phobia and fear kind of interchangeably is there a difference between a phobia and a fear and also is there a relation between a superstition and a phobia and when does a superstition cross over that phobia or fear line okay uh let me put out this disclaimer first and foremost that i'm not i'm not a psychotherapist however uh if i were to uh to answer that in this way uh it would be apropos for me and that is i think in terms of a phobia being something that's not necessarily a real concern 
or a real traumatic event, but something has triggered a stigma in my mind to make me feel that it is. And as such, that phobia is something that can be removed. A uh, fear uh, to me is something that's right there staring me in the face. I know it's gonna happen. If I stick my hand in that plug, it's probably gonna shock me. If my grandson sticks his finger in that plug and we don't put any caps on it, you know, it's probably going to shock him. And I have this fear of going to jail for having not protected the house and made it childproof. You know, that is the difference to me. Superstitions, I think, line up with phobias, in my opinion. And that is, while they do not impact our ability to function, we don't have that phobia in our minds that if I touch a balloon, I'm going to die. On the other hand, you know, that uh, that superstition is a group thing where everybody's going, yeah, you know, if, if you walk over, you know, if you walk into that studio over there, you know, you're probably going to, your feet are probably going to freeze and fall off or whatever. And, and I think from a superstition standpoint, you know, it, it goes back to old wives' tales and old, you know, um, tales from the crypt or whatever that you heard, you know, some fable or whatever, you know, uh, that never really came to fruition. But it sounded good, you know, for the for the mystery movie of the week or the, you know, the creature feature of the week. Are you sure you're not a psychotherapist? <laughs> no, but I try to make it sound good there. Uh, that was good. You no, know, Lance, try to make it sound good. You're a podcaster. That's Close enough. You can say you're a psychotherapist. That's just on a podcast. I see a certificate on your wall behind you. <laughs> yeah. See? Those certificates are, um, I thought at one point were somebody's joke. <laughs> I thought, <laughs> because I honestly thought, I have, a, I have AP Awards for Best News Anchor, AP Awards for Best News Cast. Uh, I have an Edward R. Murrow Award for Best News Cast here in New York. Uh, but I've won Emmys as well. I even have six Grammys to my name, singing with the- Six uh, Grammys? Yeah, wow. as part of the Brooklyn Tabernacle Choir. Right. Um, so it was a group oh, thing, cool. you know, with that. But yeah, I thought these were a joke because I thought I, I never enter my work in a contest. I just do what I do on the radio uh, and in these podcasts. And somebody in the industry thought, oh my goodness, that guy's different. You know, he he does a different thing. You know, let's uh, let's look at that and voila, this is what fits on the wall, at least. The trophies are elsewhere. You know what I think is a really tragic fear? Let's say you're a, a chef and your entire success is dependent on how you can taste something. And if that chef had a fear of losing their sense of taste. Oh, wow. There was an episode on a show that uh, I think it's Chef's Table where they featured one of these chefs and he got uh, a tumor in his tongue. So they had to remove part of his tongue and he lost his taste for a little while, but he got it back. And I just thought at that moment like that is a terrible fear if it, it not it's a terrible thing to happen but if you're going into a profession and you start getting overwhelmed by the feeling of even in, even in podcasting like what if i permanently lose my voice have you ever come across that fear so now um i have personally felt that fear uh couple, oh wow yeah a couple of years ago um i didn't get really really sick but for some reason i could feel a change in my voice it wasn't as pure. It wasn't as, you know, the clarity wasn't there. I didn't feel good about speaking. I would almost choke, you know, while I was doing, you know, the news. And I always fear, well, boy, what happens if I can't do this anymore? This is my livelihood. This is what I do. And it eventually cleared up. I don't know what it was, a virus of some sort. But this went on, mind you, for two weeks. That's why I thought this, this isn't a virus or anything. This isn't a one-off deal. I'm actually starting to see my voice deteriorate. That's what I felt at the time. And I thought, boy, oh boy, what am I going to do? But yeah, whatever your profession is, you you get those concerns. You know, you, and you think about Beethoven. Um, I think it was Beethoven who could not hear right. one of the greatest, you know, uh, uh, virtuosos on the planet, if not the greatest. But then I stop and I think, OK, well, you know, I still need a voice to be able to do what I do and do it to the fullest, you know. And if I can't do it to the fullest, then. I don't want to do it anymore. Right. Well, Lance, do you have any uh, weirdest fears that could make the show? I was thinking about that, and we didn't plan this. This is a this so question that Tim just asked. I've sure, asked you a sure. question. Yeah. I knew it was coming. They're trying, to, they're trying to get on the show, America. They're trying to get on the show. <laughs> Take your best shot, pal. Tim, we're coming up to you next, so go ahead. All right. All right. I'm ready. Tim's fear is terrifying. Well, I don't. I don't think it's that weird, probably. But no, no, it, it, it's probably more common than than yeah than you think. But it is still terrifying, the reality of it. But if it's the one I'm thinking about, the fear that I have that is almost overwhelming to me is that I'm afraid to talk about my fears in fear that they'll actually happen. Like I'll use an example. I hate it when we have people on the show or 
people who uh, I'm just having a conversation with, and they'll tell me about something random that happened to a friend of theirs, whether it's medical or an accident. And then I feel like in my head, I can't retell that story because it's going to happen to me. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so, so, so what do you do then? Just not listen to your friends. You go, la, 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 when they're telling you these weird things. I'll listen, but I just will never retell that story or I'll try to steer away from that story if it comes <laughs> up in conversation in another setting and the opportunity to tell a story like that comes up, I will not uh, take part in it. But it's in that your mind. Stressful. Like that earworm, yeah. it's not going it's, away. Oh, it's super stressful. So you're like constantly thinking about it, but not saying it. <laughs> well, not constantly, in certain settings. <laughs> yeah. Right that now, I'm constantly thinking about it. <laughs> Lance, I know this doctor that can probably help you with that because it sounds like <laughs> you need you need help with that. Tim, what you got? Uh, I think it's just not having water around. I guess it's a fear of dehydration in in a way. Uh, I, I drink a lot of water, and I I need it around me at all times. Basically, um, I think I can trace back where this came from in my life. And it was honestly just reading an article about Vlad the Impaler and how he used to uh, torture and kill his enemies by putting them in a box and not letting them out. And they would just die in there of dehydration and starvation and, and such. And uh, and that's it. Now, I, I've got two water bottles next to me, full water bottles all the time. I can't help myself. That's amazing. You need to come over <laughs> to the house. There's a whole system of water it's called the hudson river right outside the house you feel right at home so it's a water thing a phobia of not having water huh yeah i had that same problem mm -hmm. but it didn't have anything to do with you know your phobia mine was um when i was uh fresh out of college getting my own apartment there were instances where i didn't i wasn't able to pay the utility bill the water bill and i was afraid of being without water because they'd set it off a little bit different but nonetheless a fear. Mine will go that far too, because I, I get terrified, like actually scared when I hear people talking about water wars. Like uh, it came up recently in a conversation that the, the next world war is going to be fought over water. And I was just like, oh shit, wow. this is not going to be good for me. So Lance, you know what this does, right? When I hear him talking about being afraid of uh, being away from water, the uh, mm. the weirdest fear of these uh, the human hybrid animals, you know, the guy who was a lizard, you know, I'm just wondering if our buddy Tim is a, maybe a fish that, uh, <laughs> you know, are you? <laughs> I don't know. Check behind his ears. Are there, <laughs> are there gills? <laughs> <laughs> I remember when Tim had, like, one of the times Tim had mentioned that, and I said, just because I thought it was part of conversation, oh, well, there is a water shortage. Like, there <laughs> is a serious concern. And he was like, shut up, shut up. He was very <laughs> upset that I was uh, continuing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh so yeah that's um those are those are uh those are two that uh I, I think would qualify for your show well um i'll speak with my folks and uh you know for a small fee you know we can skip the line <laughs> and get you in there no pressure oh speaking of that that was one of my questions great segue are you just inundated with people submitting their weird fears do you have just like a backlog so, yes and no. The studio producers take in all of the information from people. And the more of these shows that we do, the more we hear from people who go, oh, I got one, I got one, I got one. So I don't get, you know, the onslaught, but the producers get them. And they kind of go through and go, oh, this would be interesting. This would be interesting. And then, of course, what they have to do is they go and find an expert you know, a psychologist or whatever the case may be, who can address that phobia or that fear. So while I don't get it directly, uh, the show gets it. You know, I can remember the guy who was afraid of um, of rats, you know, not so much the body of the rat, but the tail of the rat. So I had this guy who was, a, a, you know, a rodentologist who came on, and you will never believe in a trillion years what he showed up with on the show. Yep. A rat. A rat. A rat. This big with a tail as long. And I thought I was going to die. And oh. he goes, yeah. And he goes, yeah, I've, I've kept this with me for years, you know, just to prove a point and to show some things. Now, this end of the rat is blah, blah, blah. I said, brother, 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 brother. You know, <laughs> you don't need to show me all of that. And I, and I always ask these guys with these, these, these specialists that come in with props, are you married? And does your wife know you fool around with rats? 
<laughs> she says, and he goes, oh, I keep them all over the place. You know, I use them, you know, I take them with me on the road, you know, to, you know, for, for therapy and blah, 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 blah. I told him, brother, if you ever show up here again, <laughs> you're going to need therapy <laughs> <laughs> because I'm going to put a fear in you to never come near me with that again. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Well, Larry Mullins, uh, thank you so much for spending some time here with us today. Uh, your show, Your Weirdest Fears, is amazing. So uh, we will be listening, and uh, we urge all of our listeners to uh, as well. Thank you, folks. And uh, to check us out, you can go to Odyssey, A-U-D-A-C-Y, or wherever you pod, as I like to say. Thanks again for having me. Thank you.